Let me end with a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker in the 1950s. The average per capita cigarette consumption was about 4,000 cigarettes a year. Think about that. The average American smoked half a pack a day. The media was telling you to smoke, and famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus cared enough about your health to want you to smoke. I mean, you want to keep fit and stay slender, so you make sure to smoke and uh, eat hot dogs to stay trim and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim, right? Less fattening than that apple. I mean, sheesh, I mean, come on. <laughs> Though, apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for a youth-oriented cigarette. Oh, shameless. All right. In addition to staying fit and slender and soothing your throat, for digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative power is claimed for Philip Morris, but an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, so safe than sorry, better smoke. <laughs> like eating, smoking was a family affair. Gee, Mommy, you sure enjoy your Marlboro. You're darn tootin'. Uh, just, just one question, Mom. Um, uh, can you afford not to um, enjoy smoke Marlboros. Your kids were giving you cigarettes in the 50s. Even your dog was giving you cigarettes. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> After all, they're so round, so, oh, no woman ever says no to Winchester. They're so round, so, f so fully packed. <laughs> After all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. Even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. Yes, uh, no, look, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Yes, some, you know, doctors smoke camels. But uh, other physicians preferred lucky, so there actually was disagreement. There was, you know, eminent doctors on high and impartial medical authority call for Philip Morris. Even the specialists could not agree which cigarette was better for your throat, so best to stick to the science, right? And more scientists smoke this brand, actually. That's the, this should not be rocket science. Right? But even the rocket scientists have their own brand for the man who thinks for himself. Right? What was the government saying? Smoke luckies. I mean, who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Right? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could your th nose or throat be adversely affected when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? Look, and if you do get irritated, no problem. Your doctor can write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is from the Journal of the American Medical Association. After all, don't smoke is advice hard for patients to swallow? Reminds me of a recent survey of doctors who found the number one reason doctors don't prescribe heart-healthy diets today was their perception that uh, patients fear being deprived of all the junk they're eating. Right? After all, Philip Remor Morris reminded us, we want to keep our patients happy. To make a radical change in habit would, would do harm. You're a doctor, you don't harm your patients. The tobacco industry gave, uh, gave these medical journals big money to run ads like these. Not a problem, though Philip Morris claims come from completely reliable sources based on studies by recognized authorities uh, published in leading medical journals, even kindly offering to sell free, uh, free uh, packs of cigarettes to doctors so they can test them out themselves. So see you at the next AMA convention in the Smokers' Lounge. Right? What did the American Medical Association have to say for itself? Well, like most other medical journals, they accepted tobacco ads. They have yet to see an autopsy, the official editorial board said, with a single lesion with a Marlboro lesion on it, right, a label on it. So when mainstream medicine is saying smoking on balance may be beneficial for you, when the 
American Medical Association is saying that, then where could you turn back then if you just wanted the facts? What's the new data advanced by science? Uh, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. <laughs> Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is, when he still could speak before he died of throat cancer. Now, some of the science did leak out, causing a dip from about 11 cigarettes a day per person down to about 10. But those that got scared could always choose the cigarettes that take the fear out of smoking, right? Or even better, choose the cigarette that gives you the greatest health protection. Now, if by some miracle there was a smokingfacts.org website back then <laughs> that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters, you would have become aware of studies like this. An Adventist study in California in 1958 that showed that non-smokers may have at least 90% less lung cancer. But this wasn't the first when famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies published back in the 30s linking smoking and lung cancer were ignored. He had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was in the movies. Medical meetings were one big haze of smoke. It's like debates over cigarettes and lung cancer in Congress taking place in smoke-filled rooms, right? It makes me wonder what they serve at the Dietary Guidelines Committee breakfast buffets to this day, right? <laughs> a famous statistician by the name of uh, Ronald Fisher railed against what he called propaganda to convince the public that cigarette smoking was dangerous. He made invaluable contributions to the field, but his analysis of lung cancer and smoking was flawed by an unwillingness to examine the entire body of data available. Now his smoke screen may have been because he was a paid consultant to the tobacco industry, all right, but also because he himself was a smoker, right? Part of his resistance may have been to the association may have been because of his own fondness for smoking, which makes me wonder about some of the favorite foods that nutrition researchers may have of this day, right? You know, it always strikes me as ironic that when vegetarian researchers come out forward and list their diet as a potential conflict of interest, whereas not once in the 70,000 articles on meat in the medical literature have I ever seen a researcher disclose their non-vegetarian habits, right? Because it's normal, just like smoking was normal. So back to our thought experiment. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? With access to the science, you realize that the best available balance of evidence suggests that your smoking habit not good for you, right? So, do you change your smoking habits or do you wait? If you wait until your physician tells you between puffs to quit, you may have cancer by then. If you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, you could be dead by then. It took 25 years for the Surgeon General report to come out, it took more than 7,000 studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General report against smoking was finally released in the 1960s. You'd think maybe after the first, maybe 6,000 studies, it would have maybe give people a little heads up or something. <laughs> Powerful industry. One wonders how many people are currently suffering needlessly from dietary diseases. Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. With so much money and personal habit at stake, well, there's always going to be dissenters. But given the seriousness of the disease and the sum total of evidence, we shouldn't wait to put preventive measures in place. As a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, the science, if you were lucky to know about studies like this. Right? Now fast forward 55 years. You know, there's a new Adventist study out of California warning Americans about the risks of something else they may be putting into their mouth. It's not just that one study, right? According to the latest review, the total sum of evidence suggests that mortality from all causes put together, many of the dreaded diseases, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular diseases like stroke, significantly lower in those eating meat-free diets in addition to less cancer and diabetes. So instead of going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you or someone you know 
going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? With access to the science, you realize that the best available balance of evidence suggests that your eating habits are probably not good for you. If you wait until your physician, between bites, tells you to change your diet, it could be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report, the medical community still dragged their feet. The AMA actually went on record withholding support from the Surgeon General report. They didn't endorse it. Could it have been because they had just received mm, $10 million from the tobacco industry? Hmm. Okay. So look, we know why the AMA may have been sucking up to the tobacco industry, but why weren't individual doctors speaking out? Well, there were a few gallant souls ahead of their time, just as there are today, standing up against industries killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes, just like the majority of physicians today eat foods that contribute to our epidemic of dietary disease. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Sound familiar? Extensive scientific studies prove smoking in moderation. Okay. Today, the food industry uses the same tobacco industry tactics, supplying misinformation, twisting the science. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risk of secondhand smoke and chemicals are the same hired by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risk of candy, and the same hired by the meat industry to downplay the risk of meat. Consumption of animal products and processed foods cause at least 14 million deaths around the world every year. 14 million deaths. 14 million people dead every year. This is not a failure of individual will willpower, says the Director General of the World Health Organization. This is a failure of political will to take on big business, which is a formidable opposition. Or food governments are willing to prioritize health over big business. As we learned from the experience with the tobacco industry, a powerful corporation can sell the public just about anything. If there's one thing we learned from the tobacco experience, wrote one district judge, it's how powerful profits can be a motivator, even at the cost of millions of lives and unspeakable suffering. It may have taken 25 years for the Surgeon General report to come out, still longer for mainstream medicine to get on board, but now there are no longer ads encouraging people to inhale to their heart's content. Now there are ads from the CDC fighting back. Food-wise, there was meat for health defense, or nourishing bacon, or doctors prescribe meat, or soda for that matter. <laughs> Thank heavens tricks are habit forming, right? Now, just like there were those in the 30s, 40s, and 50s on the vanguard trying to save lives. Today, there are those turning ads about what you can do with pork butt to what the pork can do to your butt. <laughs> the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicines, meat is the new tobacco campaign. Right? As Dr. Barnard tried to get across an editorial published in the American Medical Journal Association's um, uh, Journal of Ethics, uh, Plant-based diets can now be considered the nutritional equivalent of quitting smoking. How many more people have to die, though? How many more people have to die before the CDC encourages people not to wait until open heart surgery to start eating healthy as well? How long is that going to take, though? Just like we don't have to wait until our doctors quit smoking to quit ourselves, we don't have to wait until our doctor takes a nutrition class or cleans up their own diet for changing our own eating habits. Look, it's not your doctor's fault, right? Writes a group of prominent physicians. There is a severe deficiency of nutrition education at all levels of medical training. Right? We just never taught it. Right? We know a plant, whole food, plant-based diet has been proven to reverse our number one killer, protect against type 2 diabetes and cancer. So how has this knowledge affected medical education? It hasn't. Despite the neglect of nutrition and medical education, the public considers physicians to be trusted sources. But if doctors don't know what they're talking about, they could be contributing to diet-related diseases. To stem the surging tide of chronic illness, physicians need to become part of the solution 
But we don't have to wait for that to happen. No longer do patients have to be so patient. Doctors no longer hold a professional monopoly on health information. It's been a democratization of knowledge. Right? And so until the system changes, we have to take responsibility for our own health and for our family's health. Right? We can't wait for society to catch up to the science because it's a matter of life and death. In 2015, Dr. Kim Williams became president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked why he follows his own advice to eat a plant-based diet. He said, I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my fault. Thank you. If you, uh, if you missed last year's talk, I have it on DVD, and the year before that, and the year before that, you should have come to Summerfest, that's it. But, um, as well as 25 other DVDs, all proceeds from the sale of my books, DVDs, speaking engagements, all goes to charity. Speaking of which, mark your calendars. December 8th of this year, new book coming out, How Not to Die. Uh, December 8th, very excited about not only a compilation of all my work with all the science, thousands of citations, but also a practical guide. I go through my kind of daily dozen checklist of all the things I try to include my own diet, how much greens to eat, how much beans to eat, how much exercise, how much sleep. I've been working on it for over a year. Can't wait for everyone to read it. And in the meantime, all my work is available free at nutritionfacts.org. Thanks again. <laughs> We are so fortunate to have Dr. Greger with us. I don't think there's anyone else on the planet that could do what you do. Thank you so much. And we are honored for you to debut this with us every year. Thank you so much.